Donald Trump lost two debates to me in 2020. Since then, he hadn't shown up for debate. Now he's acting like he wants to debate me again. Well, make my day, pal. I'll even do it twice. So let's pick the dates, Donald. I hear you're free on Wednesdays. He's free on Wednesdays. And I tweeted this out earlier, and I really want it to happen. They put out a blue T-shirt, the Joe Biden. Who's? I just went to Washington, D.C. Nobody is wearing Joe Biden merchandise. I didn't even know it existed, and I looked the whole time because I was going to buy some if I found it. There's just a business card magnet with his portrait on it. Uh, Blue Navy shirt. It says free on Wednesdays. And I said, Donald Trump needs to release a red shirt exactly like that. Biden's charging $35. (laughs) Trump should up it to $47. Blame it on Joe Biden's inflation. $47 in honor of the 47th presidency. I'll buy the first one. Will Sharp is in the studio. Hi. How are we doing, guys? Great to be with you. Good. Uh, There's going to be a debate happening, maybe. Yeah, I mean, first of all, you have to watch the video that Biden released. And if you watch it closely, they cut about seven different times. Why is that? So Joe Biden could not read through two sentences on a teleprompter without messing up. And that's why they must have had to cut it so many times and why the shot jumps around the way that it did. I mean, they are rigging this debate in every way, hosted by CNN, strict rules that, you know, clearly are intended to favor Joe Biden. And even so, I think President Trump is absolutely going to wipe the floor with this guy. I think it's going to be terrible. I think it could be the end of the Biden campaign. Is that what they want? I there uh, listen first of all to the point of that that being edited five however many times that it was a 13 second video it cuts and cuts it's and cuts and cuts and seconds. cuts I'm telling you this guy can't read two sentences without fumbling mumbling or or blowing a line yeah. it's absolutely insane I see Joe Biden being put out there to do things this type of stuff and I feel like they're setting him up to fail because I think they want to replace him. Uh, that I mean, that's sort of the conspiracy theory, and mm-hmm. I think it's possible. The question is, who do you replace him with? So if he resigns, if he steps back from the campaign before the convention, then every delegate at the DNC becomes unpledged, and they could vote for literally anybody. They could vote for Liz Warren. They could vote for Bernie Sanders. It's a bunch of crazy libs from all over the country. Who knows? I can't imagine they'll allow that to happen. The other alternative is for Joe Biden to become the nominee and then step down. And at that point, DNC committee men from around the country would get to vote on the replacement. So that's a more controlled process. But at that point, you're deep into August, maybe even September, standing up a new candidate and a new campaign at that point. I just don't think that's viable, even with all the money that the left has and even with all the advantages uh, that they have in the political finance space. So I think they're stuck with Biden. This is a guy who can't walk to the helicopter uh, in view of the press without stumbling or making an embarrassment of himself. They're surrounding him when he walks out so that it's not so obvious. I mean, they are going to pump him full of B vitamins and amphetamines and hope for the best at this CNN debate. And I think it's going to be absolutely brutal. President Trump is sharp. He's on point. Every public appearance, he is absolutely crushing it. They can rig the rules however they want. I think it's going to be a great day for the Republican Party. Speaking, I'm excited. I, I, I'm very excited. It's a good day for, for us here to be able to consume a debate in June, to have a date on the calendar that we can uh, view this. And we'll likely be doing that with you, the listener. So uh, stay tuned for more information there. We're speaking with Will Scharf. He is one of Donald Trump's attorneys, a former federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of Missouri. He's also a candidate for Missouri Attorney General. And we like talking to you about the legal things that are that Donald Trump is facing because you have a very keen, unique knowledge on on all of this. But the political ramifications can't be dismissed for what it looks as though the Biden administration has levied against Donald Trump. It just makes him stronger. I, I think that's absolutely right. And the fact that Biden is mocking him about being in trial, that's the I hear you're free on Wednesday's line. I mean, it just goes to show that. Joe Biden views this campaign of political prosecution, of persecution against President Trump as a crucial part of his campaign. What the left denies every single day, which is that these prosecutions are political. We all know they're political. The left denies it every single day. And here's Biden basically admitting that the campaign of lawfare is interfering with President Trump's ability to campaign. I mean, they're saying the quiet part out loud. That was another thing that was just shocking to me about that stupid video they released today. Yeah, it's like they don't get it. And I think 
you know, I know that you know President Trump personally and you work with him, so you have an understanding of his, how he operates, who he is as an individual. Um, but the things that sometimes, in my view, from where I sit as, as an observer, that sometimes trip him up or inflame the anti-Trump, the never-Trump base... Joe Biden and the, his Department of Justice have very much so limited Donald Trump's ability to go out there and do the things that maybe fire up the Trump base, but also get the anti-Trump base going and become part of the story. They've tried to quiet him down, take him off the field as much as possible. And in doing so, I think people are looking at this presidential race more as a referendum on Joe Biden than they would have had they not put Donald Trump on the sidelines. I, I mean, I'll say this. They've put President Trump on trial in New York. They've incapacitated him for four days a week, every every week for basically the last month. And even so, Trump had more people at that New Jersey rally over the weekend than Biden has had this entire election cycle combined. I mean, this is a guy, President Trump, who is the best natural campaigner, the best natural political talent in American history who has fired up and motivated the American people like no political candidate in our lifetimes. And I think that as soon as this trial gets done and when he gets back out on the campaign trail, he's just absolutely going to crush it. And it's going to be a very, very sad November uh, for everybody wearing one of these stupid blue shirts. <laughs> All six of them. <laughs> yeah. Get I mean, the red shirts out there. I want one. Well, I'll, like, I'll buy two. You know, the Trump, the Trump campaign's biggest problem is people – like selling unauthorized MAGA hats because there is so much demand for yes. Trump apparel. The Biden campaign's problem is that, as you said, even their supporters want nothing to do with the guy and aren't wearing his stuff, just don't care. Let's talk about the unauthorized MAGA stuff because I just was in Washington, D.C., and I ended up buying one. The first person that I asked, I assume it was unauthorized, it didn't look authorized. The first person I asked was had a, a kiosk of, of merchandise no Joe Biden merchandise. A lot of Washington, D.C., a lot of America, a lot of Trump. Clearly, there is demand because they would have Biden stuff there if people would buy it. They don't. I asked the guy, are these made in America? And it was the stupidest question this man has heard in his life. He's like, no, they're not made in America. If they were made in America, I wouldn't be afford to, able to afford to sell them. Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, well, I'm not going to buy it then. And then I caved later because my my son wanted to buy one. Um it sounds like you had a great trip to D.C. It I was hope great. That, I hope the Gettysburg trip was uh, was less fraught than your interaction with this street uh, yes. merchandise salesman. So. I, everything <laughs> that we were able to take in, I just like was it was shut up and listen for me, shut up and watch and just take it in. And I want to go back and do deeper dives when I'm not, you know, connected to 14 year old kids. Um, Did the kids enjoy it, though? Did, did yes. you think that the eighth graders had a good time? And three three days, top to bottom, packed full of stuff. And by the end, I mean, we, we walked like 23,000 steps a day, and it was um, a lot. And But they were all engaged, and they were into it, and they were asking questions. And, you know, sometimes they get a little squirrely, but it's usually when they're hungry. Um, but I, I do want to ask about the Trump merchandise that is out there in Washington, D.C., because I'm sure you spend more time in D.C. than I do. But your experience of traveling the country and the interest level that exists with Donald Trump, because for whatever reason, Donald Trump was cool with the kids. And once my son put his he asked for it and I told him no a bunch of times before I finally said, fine, you can have it. Because I wanted him to know what it meant to wear that hat and what people were going to do and say to him if he had it on. Mm -hmm. And it really kind of struck me because here I am, somebody who does support Donald Trump will be voting for Donald Trump. I wanted to shield my son from having to bear the burden of wearing that hat. And now I imagine, like, what's it like to be actually Donald Trump and, and the full force of that going against that one singular man. But it does seem to me, as we were walking around Washington, D.C., I mean, kids were calling each other out, like, I love your hat, man, Mag. I mean, it was, I'm like, these are children. But there's something about it that they understand that I assume is coming from within their homes, possibly. They're kids. They're not from Washington, D.C. They're from all over the country. I, I what is it? I think kids, teenagers, naturally rebel against authority. And the left has become so authoritarian and so totalitarian and is attempting to control so many aspects of society that the Gen Zers are rebelling against that. And they see in President Trump an avatar, a guy who's not a— uh, who's not afraid to call out uh, diversity culture and the craziness that they're seeing every day in their schools, a guy who's willing to be unabashedly pro-American 
and pro our principles, pro our Constitution. I think it's kind of crazy, but what we're seeing happen right now is a generation of young people who have been oppressed by the radical left and who are naturally rebelling against that, the same way that back in the 60s, you had hippies and stoners and whatever rebelling against the uh, the mainstream authorities back then. I think it's great. You know, we've got college kids involved in our campaign. They're so much more fired up than I was at their age. Yeah. And they're so much more just knowledgeable and in tune, whether it's on policy issues, whether it's, it's on these big cultural fights. I mean, I have great faith in the future of America because of the kids that are that are coming through. I mean, these scenes out of these southern schools where you have these radical pro Hamas tent, <laughs> tent camps or whatever, yes. and you've got the frat guys shouting them down and defending the American flag. I mean, they got to make a movie about this. It's just, it's absolutely incredible, and and really gives me hope for the future. I agree. I agree completely. And you know, these are COVID kids. These, yeah. these kids are going to be old enough to understand. You know, some of them. My my son was. Fourth grade, the the second semester of fourth grade is when they went home. And then because we send our kids to a Lutheran school, they went back into school that fall, even in Illinois, unlike a lot of other kids who did not. So they had that benefit, but they were still masked. They were still social distanced. These were all Illinois um, regulations at the time. They know what that was like. They will never forget that. And and that is ingrained in their memory of growing up. So I think that that is an important thing that is going to stick with these kids. Those the 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 college graduates who are not getting a college graduation because yeah. the protesters have taken it away from them and they they are the same ones that lost their high school graduation due to covid. If you look at the political parties now that have had the opportunity to have the responsibility of the offices of the president or congress or whatever, if you look at the left versus the right right now, the left wants to control every facet of your life and they will tell you and cancel you if you do it wrong and for whatever reason the right is like the the classic liberal of what i remember growing up with the liberals were the cool people that they wanted you to just like stay out of my house stay out of my bedroom let me live my life i don't want the government interfering it's completely flipped yeah well you look at watch every 80s movie and the bad guy, every 80s like college movie, think Animal House. And the bad guy is an author- authoritarian right-wing college administrator. <laughs> Today, the authoritarians that these kids are living living through in college are these left-wing diversity-addled nutjobs uh, who believe in the DEI cult, who, who did all the crazy stuff during COVID. I mean, it's a total role reversal, and I think it's understandable that young people across America are reacting exactly as they're reacting. I think Trump is going to do better uh, with the, let's say, the under 25 vote than any Republican president in living memory. I think this is the same reason why you see African Americans and Hispanic Americans uh, turning out. They're going to be turning out in numbers that we've never seen before for the Republican Party, certainly in modern history. Uh, this is a it's a fundamental overturning of the conventional established political order in this country. And I'm uh, I'm excited. I'm bringing popcorn. Yeah. What I mean, what does Joe Biden have to offer those young people? Uh, I I, he's he, he's so unrelatable. I, I, I mean, I don't think Joe Biden has anything to offer to anybody. Uh, I don't think he's running the country. And that's maybe the scariest thing about this White House I mean, he's incapable of making it through a press conference. He's incapable of making it through even the most staged events. Uh, I mean, the guy just you look at him and you do not see American strength. You don't see the American presidency. It transcends politics. This guy shouldn't be in the White House. And I think the American people understand that. Yeah. Don't believe your lying eyes. Uh, All right. Will Sharp in studio with us right now. We're going to stick around with him for the rest of the hour. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Trump trials, how they are lining up, how they are falling apart, if they are uh, staying the course. So stick around for that. Trump attorney Will Sharp in studio here with us on St. Louis's home for conservative talk. 97.1 FM talk. Welcome back to the Annie Fry show. We've got Will Sharp in studio here and the conversation off the air is as good as the conversation on the air. So we thought we better get back on the air. Um, Will Sharp is an, an attorney for Donald Trump. He is a candidate for attorney general here in the state of Missouri. And he's also a former federal prosecutor for the Eastern District of Missouri. Um, I don't know what you're bound by, what you can say and what you can't say about the Manhattan trial. So I'm going to ask a very open-ended question. But what is your assessment of the trial up to this point? I understand that Cohen is the last witness that the prosecution is going to be calling. So they would have made their case by the time they're done with Cohen. I still don't think that if you asked 100 Americans 
about the trial that half of them would know anything about what's going on and the other half of them wouldn't be able to articulate what Donald Trump is being charged with. Yeah, the, the prosecution in court said that they're resting once uh, once Michael Cohen's off the stand. Um, I think when you look at the trial, and I've read the transcripts every day, I know what happened there, they haven't come close to meeting any sort of evidentiary standard for conviction here. Uh, I mean, they have not proven beyond a reasonable doubt anything, much less the crimes alleged in the indictment here. Uh, a lot of legal scholars have said that based on this trial record, uh, Judge Mershon should issue a directed verdict, uh, should just say that there's what not— What does that mean? A directed verdict is where a judge at the close of evidence basically says that as a matter of law, there has not been enough valid evidence introduced for any fair jury to convict, and therefore he just enters uh, a, a, a verdict of innocence, essentially. A, Can he do that in the converse? Verdict. No, he can no. only say this isn't even worth the jury's time. That's exactly right. It's, it's essentially it's the equivalent of a judge dismissing a civil case uh, in the criminal context. So a lot of people are saying it should be a directed verdict. I won't hold my my breath for that. Uh, but when you look at the evidence introduced, then I, I I'm sure that the jury has been carefully watching uh, everything that's happened in this trial. When you look at the evidence introduced, it doesn't come anywhere close to proving that President Trump committed business records fraud, which is at the heart of this case. There's been a ton of tabloid gossip. There's been a ton of uh, extraneous smoke and mirrors type evidence. Uh, but on the core of the allegations here, they just haven't proved their case. Uh, it's it's astounding to a lot of the people watching this from afar. Uh, it's less astounding to those of us who were sort of deep in this and familiar with, with the underlying facts. Uh, but I think that President Trump should be acquitted. Uh, I think the cross-examination of each of these witnesses, including the start of cross-examination uh, against Cohen on Tuesday, have been damning. I think President Trump's trial team has done an outstanding job uh, just showing how baseless this case is. I think we're going to see that continue to play out in court You know, towards the end of this week. Uh, we're back in trial tomorrow. Uh, but overall, I, I mean, this case should have never been brought, and it certainly— uh, I, they're just nowhere close to proving that any crime was committed here. Take us as much behind the scenes as you can to prepare the defense of Donald Trump, especially in a case like this where information was withheld, your ability to fight back in the court of public opinion when other people are not gagged at all. Like, how? what does it look like to make sure that you provide the best defense possible in a... a in a case like this where it just seems like everything is tilted to begin with? Yeah, so the three key lawyers on the trial team, there's some sort of supporting actors as well, uh, but it's Todd Blanche, uh, Emil Beauvais, and then Susan Necklace. Um, Todd Blanche is an outstanding lawyer. I've worked with him closely on the D.C. case, the Florida case as well. Uh, Todd is a, a former federal prosecutor from New York. He led the Gang and Violent Crime Unit in the Southern District of New York, which is one of the largest, most prestigious U.S. attorney's offices in the country for many years. Uh, he's also been an, an eminent practitioner in private practice. Uh, I'd consider him one of the best criminal defense attorneys at this point in the country. Uh, Emile Beauvais, who works closely with Todd, another just brilliant, brilliant legal mind. Uh, Susan is a highly accomplished New York litigator. Uh, this is a killer team of lawyers around President Trump there. Uh, in addition to them, they're sort of supporting actors. Uh, the team that I work with here in Missouri, we've worked closely with them on certain briefing issues, including this gag order uh, that we're, we're taking up to the New York Court of Appeals uh, imminently to try to get that overturned uh, before the end of trial. Um, but it's, it's really, it's been a, a great and interesting process for me just getting to work with so many great attorneys. Uh, you, you alluded to some of the evidentiary issues here. I mean, it's core to a defendant's constitutional rights that they have access to the evidence, uh, discovery, you know, call it whatever you will, the evidence that's going to be presented against them in court. Uh, we had over 100,000 pages of documents essentially withheld from us until less than a month before trial, uh, which in a trial of this importance, of this magnitude, in any trial, I mean, that's just unheard of. Uh, every step of the way, the deck has been stacked against our team by the New York court system and by the prosecution. And yet I still think they're doing an outstanding job. And I think we're seeing that play out in court every single day. We're speaking with Will Sharp here in studio. I want to ask about your observations of Donald Trump as he is supposed to be campaigning. Of course, he's not. Um, you know, the, the the fodder that comes out of this is that he's sleepy in, in there and he's, you know, I don't know if he's inattentive is what they're trying to suggest that he is that he says it's very cold in there. 
does he is his job to just sit there and be quiet and be still for seven eight hours a day is that yes that's exactly right like and, you just got it i mean that's like a prison and, and i've been in court with him when something kind of uh grabs his attention uh he'll write a note to you or he'll sort of whisper something in your ear and there have been press reports that you know he's doing that he's not sleeping through trial i promise you first of all <laughs> as you noted it's way too cold to sleep in that courtroom um, sometimes President Trump, when he's listening intently to something, he'll kind of close his eyes and yeah. lean back a little bit. Uh, a lot of people do that. The press is just seizing on anything they can find right now uh, to point to weakness in President Trump uh, because there really isn't any evidence of that. Uh, like I would encourage all your listeners, pull the video of that New Jersey rally and just watch it. I mean, this is a guy, he has more energy now than he did in, even in 2016 when he took the political scene by absolute storm. Uh, This is a guy who is going to romp back into the White House in November. And I don't think any of this lawfare, I don't think any of these extra legal efforts uh, to drag him into court and to hold up his campaign. uh, It's despicable. It's disgraceful. But fortunately, I don't think it's at the end of the day going to have any meaningful impact on his ability to campaign. Why is it so cold? It's an old building. Um, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Uh, like, I've, is there a strategy here? I'll, I'll I say, don't understand I, it. I'll say, as a lawyer, I'd much rather be in a cold courtroom than in a warm courtroom. Yeah. Warm courtroom, the day drags, you start to get a little drowsy, you start missing some things. Cold courtroom, at least you stay alert. Um, but yeah, I mean, this courthouse is just a dump. Uh, I've been inside <laughs> there before. It's it's not a pleasant place. Um, and it it I'll make a broader point there. You think about America. You think about the history of this country. We used to build big, beautiful things. I mean, you look at sort of neoclassical Mm. architecture, even here in downtown St. Louis. uh, We used to be really good at creating beautiful public spaces and beautiful public buildings. That was one of the biggest things that I took in and being in D.C. Like, uh, look at what we look at what we did with so much less. It's it's awe inspiring. I mean, you walk even through the the U.S. Capitol. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are just beautiful, beautiful buildings. We were at the Supreme Court a couple of weeks ago. It's a beautiful building. Nowadays, we just build garbage. You look at these sort of new modernist buildings. You look at the statues that we put up in our parks. It just it it looks disgusting. And I think it speaks a lot to the degradation of culture uh, over the last century. That's a much broader point. But, yeah, this courthouse is terrible. (laughs) Everybody who's there. So he's not lying that it's cold. No, the press, our team, like literally everybody who's there is like this is an uncomfortable, decrepit old courthouse that is in desperate need of a refresh. So. Your thoughts. So when is Trump not going to have to sit in this courtroom any longer? Well, look, if the prosecution rests uh, at the end of this week, um, I guess it depends how long cross-examination of Michael Cohen goes on for. Uh, Our team then has the opportunity to put on witnesses of our own. And that's going to be a decision that the trial team will have to make uh, after they've uh, finished up with with cross-examination here. Uh, whether they want to put on any witnesses at all, whether President Trump uh, may testify. That's something that President Trump has talked about publicly. Um, We we may, we may not. We'll see. Uh, Once the defense rests, which would presumably be within the next, uh, you know, week at at the outside, uh, then the jury gets charged. Uh, The judge and and the the two teams will hash out jury instructions. Uh, The jury gets charged and then the jury goes into a a black box Mm -hmm. and they'll deliberate. Uh, They'll consider all the evidence and their charge is deciding whether the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt uh, that the crimes that have been alleged actually occurred. I think this could be a very, very quick jury deliberation. I don't think there's any evidence that President Trump can. Sometimes quick means they just return a quick guilty verdict. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's the opposite. Uh, I remember I had a jury here in, uh, in federal court in St. Louis go out one time and I was a little bit nervous about some aspects of the case. They came back in uh, an hour and a half and they ordered lunch in the middle, which means they deliberated <laughs> for about 10 minutes. And I was, I was pretty, order? I, need I, to know. I, I think sandwiches, is a, but I was pretty confident at that point that I was getting a guilty verdict. Um, but juries can be unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, jury, I, I think you had Deroy Mur- Murdoch on before and he right. was talking a little bit about his experiences in jury trials. Uh, juries can be unpredictable, but you know, Frederick Douglass said that a, a man's rights rest in three boxes, uh, the ballot box, the jury box, and the cartridge box. Uh, I think alongside the Second Amendment and our system of elections, uh, the jury system is a linchpin of the American system, the American constitutional order. And I have great faith that the jury is going to see through all the smoke and mirrors and, and do the right thing here. We don't have much time left, but uh, do you think 
we'll have a verdict by the end of May, June twenty four. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think by the end of May would be a would be a reasonable guess. Reasonable. Yeah, yeah I think that's reasonable. And what picks up next? Uh, well, the other cases are really stalled out. Uh, Georgia is going nowhere. We're dealing with this disqualification issue of Fonnie Willis uh, that's up before the the Georgia appellate courts now. Florida, I mean, that case is just collapsing. Uh, Judge Eileen Cannon stayed the trial date there and and said that there are so many issues that need to be resolved. She wasn't even willing to set a tentative future trial date. Uh, D.C., which is the case that most legal commentators thought was going to go to trial first, we're waiting on a Supreme Court opinion. Uh, depending on how the Supreme Court rule, if they rule in our favor, uh, we could have years of litigation over uh, the scope of immunity that they recognize. And the, that ruling by the end of June or that, July? We, we expect that by the end of June. June, okay. Um, and even if we were to lose at that point, based on the way Supreme Court rules work and based on the the flow and pace of federal litigation and where our trial clock was when we originally got our stay in that case, chances of that case moving to trial before the election are, are slim to nil, I would say essentially zero. Um, so I think this is going to be our last trial before Election Day. I think President Trump's going to have the ability to go out and do what he does best, which is campaign effectively for office. I think watching all of these things materialize when the primary was still really yeah. hot, that What's actually materializing now looks like pulling the inside straight. And uh, it's pretty amazing to think that if these events continue the way you're saying, that this whole thing has collapsed the way it is. Well, it's it, you could say it's pulling an inside straight, but it's more like pulling an inside straight when you know what cards are coming next. Because we knew yeah. that we knew the strength of our legal arguments and we knew the weakness of the we, weaknesses of the cases we were facing. Uh, so we came into this optimistic. Uh, we've maintained our optimism, and I think our team is is crushing it for President Trump. Will Scharf, uh, Donald Trump attorney, candidate for Missouri Attorney General, former federal prosecutor, our dear friend here on the Annie Fry Show. Thanks for being with us. Great to be with you guys.